The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. So uh, I'm really excited to be here today to share with you some of the work that I've done for the past five years. And uh, man, we have a lot of problems in the concrete industry. Uh, no kidding. Um, you hear this on the news that the infrastructure is falling apart and people think that's like a hundred year old bridge that's falling apart. But some of these bridges are not that old. So uh, take a look at this bridge in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, it was um, built in 2005 at a cost of over 700 million dollars. The DOT mandate was for 100 years for chloride uh, to reach reinforcement. Yet, just three years later, um, you can see uh, with the naked eye surface cracking and uh, efflorescence on the towers. Um, then um, I drive by after the rain uh, in 2014 and uh, there is these towers and, and, and all this, this concrete um, is um, it, it, the cracking is, is visible um, uh, throughout after the rain. So, um, in not to dive too deep into this thing, um, on a quick take, I mean, what, what are the potential causes of this? Um, were the temperature gradients from the core to surface uh, too great when they poured this concrete? Um, was the um, demand of the schedule um, call for hot mis mixes that, that use perhaps too much Portland cement that in turn generated too much calcium hydroxide? Is the form work the culprit? Uh, too many variables in the process that are impossible to control, disconnect uh, between, you know, parties involved? Um, so, <clears throat> you know, like uh, we're, um, um, we heard Jason talk before, uh, you, you can joke about concrete being cracked or not being cracked, but at the end of the day we have to ask ourselves why are some, some Roman concrete structures still largely intact after 2,000 years sitting um, in the salt water uh, without any cracking or any, any problems? And I like to introduce this simple concept of cement being fuel. And to illustrate that, <coughs> I want to show you this um, uh, on the left here um, is a Ford police interceptor, 1965. That was the fastest stock car in 1965. You go from zero to 60 in 7.3 seconds with about five to 10 miles a gallon, um, you know, uh, fuel consumption. And out of that engine, you get a whopping 45 horsepower per 1,000 cc. You fast forward to, um, you know, modern times here today, and you have a Porsche 911 Turbo that you go zero to 60 in 3.4 seconds with about 17 to 25 miles per gallon. And that engine performance is 140 horsepower per 1,000 cc. So <clears throat> the idea here is that um, it, it, it is natural to think that if you want uh, greater performance, <laughs> that you just use more fuel. Um, so in the concrete industry, if you want to get improved performance, you just use more, you know, cement powder. Um, but with all that additional cement, you get heat, you get all sorts of other problems. So what about this concept to improve performance by using less fuel, improve concrete performance by using less Portland cement. Um, here's a uh, chart of a project that we did in Atlanta. Uh, what we got here is conventionally formed concrete. There's a disconnect in, in our view between the formwork being simply used as a mold uh, which in essence it is to some extent the environment which you place the concrete in in its infancy. And <clears throat> what we got here is 80-20 um, concrete mix, 540 pounds of Portland cement 
120 pounds of fly ash type F, and <coughs> you place it in the um, concrete form, and as the um, hydration reaction gets going, you reach uh, peak temperature, uh, in this case about 42 uh, degrees Celsius, in, in very short order, like in 18 to, you know, 12 to 18 hours. And then immediately, this typically happens overnight, immediately you start um, um, dropping the temperature through the heat loss of, of the form, and by the next morning, about 24 hours after placement, you reach ambient temperature. Um, so this is the red um, um, graph line. The dark blue line is the ambient temperature. Um, the light blue line is the C39 lab cylinders of this mix. So we have this um, thermal shock at the point of concrete has no strength to speak of, and that's where you get the nano cracking, micro cracking, that later on um, uh, turns into that surface cracking. Um, so what uh, we have here is uh, you look at what a conventional form looks like. The glowing hot yellow color is basically the heat being lost through the form. Um, which the surface of that form is the same temperature as the concrete inside. So <clears throat> as a, um, a, as a uh, side note, uh, I feel like the Portland cement industry is spending billions of dollars a year to embed energy into the cement powder, yet we just let it escape and we, 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 we lose it um, right off the bat. So, and that's just the beginning, because then immediately, you know, after that first day, you strip the forms, and then you lose the moisture. And every day, for the life of that structure, then uh, that concrete is going to go through um, the up and down of whatever ambient temperature you have. And I'm looking at this chart. And I'm wondering, is, is concrete's life destined to ride the bull its entire life? I mean, can, can we do better with this? Um, so we come to what is self-annealing concrete? <clears throat> this is a new concept that we have struggled with how to define what we're about to show you that we're doing. And, and self-annealing is the process in which the mixing water and the internal heat generated by the concrete, the cement hydration, are retained within the formwork to accelerate the curing process. And this process accelerates strength gain, reduces shrinkage and thermal stresses, which results into a more durable concrete. And then it allows high supplementary cementitious material replacement of ordinary Portland cement in concrete mis mixes which will help reduce the CO2 impact, uh, potentially lowering the cost. Uh, the self annealed uh, concrete um, will help us uh, with the um, supplementary cementitious uh, material um, by eliminating calcium hydroxide um, and have a less permeable uh, concrete with the same uh, water cement uh, ratio. So now <clears throat> we're taking the same concrete mix and we place it in the self annealing environment. And uh, how do we do that? Basically, we take insulation and we place it right on the surface of the concrete, uh, visually, uh, for an example, inside the formwork, if you will. Um, and uh, so we can retain the heat of hydration, retain the moisture. Uh, and then um, all sorts of things happen. Uh, at seven days, um, so, so we climb uh, to a far greater temperature, we sustain that temperature for a while, and then we gradually drop the, lose the heat, in this case about one Celsius uh, uh, degree a day. At seven days, we get 6200 PSI with the self-vanilled concrete while the conventionally formed concrete 
is at 3200 psi. Uh, basically, we eliminate the thermal shock and remove most of the variables from the concrete curing process. Here, here's a picture of uh, the morning after, like the conventional forms lose all the heat, but an insulated form retains the heat. So the surface, the outside surface of an insulated form would be the same temperature as the uh, ambient temperature, while the concrete is twice as hot inside. This is at 20 hours, 6 o'clock in the morning, the day after we pour the concrete. Um, so some people come to me over time and said, yeah, you're getting all the strength up front and then you're going to lose strength over time. Well, we're not losing strength over time. So this is data here of compressive strength, uh, of course, taken <coughs> at 14 months. And um, uh, there's a lot to, to, to see here. On one hand, the conventional form concrete takes about 90 days to come up to the same strength that the self annealed concrete came up in seven days. But as you can see, we're still gaining strength even at 14 months. And another thing is that if we kept the concrete insulated for its life, the green line that you see here, it barely moves up and down a couple of degrees Celsius a day, even though the ambient temperature moves, you know, 20, 30 degrees a day. So eliminate the early thermal shock, eliminate the thermal stresses for the life of the structure if we kept the concrete insulated for, for its life. Now, we mentioned that we can take high supplementary cementitious material, concrete mixes, and, um, and use those. This is a mix of one-third uh, 220 pounds of Portland cement, 215 pounds of slag cement, and 215 pounds of fly ash type F. And this is a mix that you wouldn't even consider for anything else other than, you know, a mass concrete foundation or, or pour. And we put it through the same curing environment. Here you see the red um, line of the conventional form concrete, the green line the self annealed concrete, at seven days, we get 5,100 PSI versus 1,500 PSI. And when we got these results, you look like, hey, what's wrong here? Like, it, 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 it's hard to believe. This mix in particular, if you were to go off of the C39, you know, standard test, at seven days, you have 980 PSI in the lab. No wonder nobody would ever use that concrete mix for anything else. Um, and another thing here is that in a conventional form, basically, it, it's 60 days or so until you reach the seven-day compressive strength of the self-annealed uh, concrete. So we can take these mixes now and use them in just about any application. The self-annealing formwork versus conventional formwork, um, I don't want to talk down on the formwork folks. They, um, they have tremendous improvements over the engineering of the systems, over productivity and so on. But at the end of the day, it's still only a mold for concrete. And I believe that formwork can be a whole lot more than just a mold for concrete. You can um, improve properties of concrete through it. Through the self anneal formwork, we can reduce the moisture loss, <coughs> reduce cracking, reduce permeability, improve the early strength, improve long-term strength, improve durability, reduce carbonation. So what we did is we said, hey, we're gonna go to Denver. We wanted to do a thermal modeling of a structure that could be right here downtown Denver. So this is a 15-story building that could be an office building, a hotel, uh, condominiums. We uh, modeled this for a spring construction schedule uh, where the ambient temperature was 50 degrees Fahrenheit plus or minus 15, you know, daily temperature fluctuations. The placement of concrete temperature was 60. 
Uh, we broke it down between all these elements. Uh, we have a five foot thick mat foundation and uh, about 17,000 uh, cubic yards of concrete. We've taken the same two mixed uh, designs that we looked at before and you can see here that a, a typical straight Portland cement uh, concrete mix design has about a 552 uh, pounds of CO2 per yard. If you were to use the one-third, one-third mix, you have a 56% CO2 reduction, while the 80-20 mix, we have an 18% uh, reduction. So here's our uh, five-foot thick mat foundation. We modeled the one-third, one-third, one-third mix, which would be a generally accepted mix for that application. The continuous line is, um, is, is the self-annealed uh, concrete. The, um, the dotted line is, is a conventional form concrete and on this uh, mass uh, concrete pour you can see that we pretty much uh, we, we have less temperature differential between the core and the surface uh, while in the conventionally formed concrete you are maintaining you, you're, you're losing the heat a little more rapidly but the biggest thing is you have the surface already losing heat at a higher rate than the core. Then we move to the foundation wall and the rest of the wall and um, the, the notion here is that that low carbon mix which is uh, a, a better, uh, uh, that produce, the self annealed concrete produces better physical and chemical properties. We can take that mix now vertical and use it in all these elements where before you couldn't. And here we model side by side the one-third, one-third mix and the 80-20 uh, mix. The 80-20 mix would be a mix that you would use, um, you know, pretty much in a, in, an in a vertical application like that. So I'm going to go a little bit uh, quicker through these slides. Basically they show the thermal modeling which is consistent with the real life measurements that we've done in the Atlanta project. And the, the thing, no matter what element uh, we, we model, whether we have these uh, 18 by 18 columns and beams, or you have the slab or the walls, um, it, it's, the same, it's the same result. Less temperature differential between the surface and the core, uh, the self annealed concrete, we have a more sustained uh, reaction that and, and then a lower cooling a slower cooling off uh, while in the conventional form concrete you you're still riding the bull so um, self annealed concrete with high supplementary cementitious material replacement is a superior concrete compared to just standard Portland cement concrete. We have reduced moisture loss, reduced cracking, we get reduced permeability, improved strength, improved durability, and this is, you know, comes up even more and more. Somebody said the other day, <laughs> we're running out of good uh, aggregate in this country, so ASR is going to be more and more of a problem, especially in the Midwest. We get improved ASR resistance with those mixes, and improve CO2 reduction. If we take this building and on you know 17,000 cubic yards of concrete, ordinary Portland cement concrete mix would have about 4,800 tons of CO2 impact. With an 80-20 mix, you cut that down to 3,900 tons of CO2. But then you go to one-third, one-third, you cut it by more than half. Uh, you're down to 2,100 tons of, of CO2 impact. This is assuming 650 pounds a <coughs> cubic yard of cementitious material. So another way to, to describe the self-annealing process, it is by looking at the heat generated by the cement hydration retained in the formwork to create an autocatalytic reaction where the temperature is elevated and maintained and 
uh, until most of the cement particles are hydrated and this causes the cement hydration reaction rate to increase which in turn will create more calcium hydroxide available for reacting with uh, SCMs quicker. Then more calcium hydroxide at a higher temperature early on will cause the SCMs to react and reacting at a higher temperature will increase the SCM reaction rate. Doing this while we're maintaining uh, the moisture and a more uniform temperature in the concrete minimizes shrinkage and thermal stresses. So now we get a concrete that has enhanced properties due to a more complete hydration, elimination of calcium hydroxide and reduced stress in the curing process and all while we're reducing the carbon footprint through more efficient use of the cement and primarily the energy that's embedded in the cement. This is an illustration of what the self-annealing process uh, accelerated hydration looks like versus a normal hydration would look like. Um, so at the end, what is, what's best for concrete? Uh, to sum it all up, you, we need to eliminate the thermal stresses before the concrete reaches specified strength. Eliminate the calcium hydroxide by adding more supplementary cementitious materials. Um, and if we can eliminate the thermal stresses for the life of the structure, uh, that's even better. So how do we do that? We insulate the concrete at least in the first few days until it reaches specified strength and if possible insulate the concrete for the life of the structure. So thank you. Any questions? Enjoyed your presentation, thank you. A couple of questions. One is how do you go about getting the self-annealing concrete specified on projects and what, what's, uh, how many projects have been completed with this? Thank you. Like everybody else that is trying to uh, do something new, we, in many, um, in many ways, uh, we're going against um, some common assumptions. One being that heat is bad and heat has to be mitigated. Uh, we find that heat is good. You can incorporate it in your process. And so there is, you know, a lot of education to do. Um, the more progressive uh, folks, um, when they see this presentation, they fully understand what we're talking about and they don't see any issue with it. It will be uh, beneficial to have uh, a protocol written and, uh, and, and standards uh, written. Uh, we're not advocating taking 950 pounds of Portland cement mixes to put it in an insulated form. We're advocating taking concrete with supplementary cementitious material and put it through the self-annealing process. <clears throat> so that's kind of like how do we go about it. Uh, the number of projects that we've done, uh, we've done testing over four years and actual projects uh, that have been built for third-party commercial uh, uh, projects uh, or two. You talk about insulated forms, but most of the time you have, you, your thermal problems happen at the boundaries of the pore you have at the top of a wall you've got rebar dials sticking out at the side of a wall you've got rebar dials how are you insulating that? Um, that's a very good question um, you just have to do your best to insulate that and uh, and you know having a subsequent pour that follows and retains the the heat of hydration and and in in direct thermal contact with the previous pour would help. So you sort of have a more continuous heat retention. But it's not impossible to do. It is a challenge, I understand, uh, in the field to insulate uh, rebar sticking out of a, a round rebar sticking out of the top of a column. Um, we also have seven day water cures, so you can't, it's kind of hard to insulate that if you're pouring water on. 
I, I really appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, in this case, the initial mixing water is more than sufficient to hydrate all cement. So by retaining that moisture, you're not going to need to moisture cure in a conventional way, put uh, moisture back into the system. So that's a non-issue in this case. Thank you. Yeah, it seems to me that one of the major challenges you'll face here is, is project schedule because you've got contractors that have one set of forms, even if they're insulated, which I assume they cost a little bit more to insulate, but even if they're insulated, they're going to want to break, break the forms, wreck the forms. In many cases, they want to wreck them eight hours after, after the concrete is placed so that they can move on to the next, the next level. Um, I, I guess, do you have any thoughts or comments on that? You've advocated here, let, leave them there for five days or four days or whatever, but uh, there's some economics there too. Um, thank you. Uh, th this is really good because I didn't touch on that. I only focused on the, the process and not on, on the uh, elements that you do it with. Um, so there are three different ways that you can do this, okay? You can have insulated removable forms that in a sense you have instead of conventional plywood you have a plywood with an insulated core and that would be the case where you say you leave them in place for three days or or some extent of time uh, which I which that will help with this process but it is um, it, it may not be as popular people leave forms behind the second option is you have energy codes requirements of continuous insulation over exterior building envelopes. And in that sense, you can incorporate a composite insulated foam panel to stay in place for the life of that structure. And so you have a combination of the removable form that you keep going on with it and the permanent insulating composite foam board that stays behind as part of the building. The third option is that you have a removable insulating board in the sense of a form liner that you place inside the formwork, conventional formwork, and then <coughs> you keep that until the time that you achieve the belt curve of that uh, maturity curve, uh, and then remove those insulating boards and reuse them, um, and, and then you wouldn't have to keep the conventional form in place for any more time than you would normally would. But I really appreciate that question. Question in the back? So I guess I just had a question kind of going back to your mass concrete and where this could be potentially very useful in terms of not having to thread like cooling pipes and things through 15 foot thick mats potentially, but this is where I'm getting at is A, normally what would you do at the base of mass concrete where typically you're pouring on either soil or a protection slab or a mud slab and then what do you do and then is that thermal is the insulation enough to prevent a temperature gradient throughout the concrete initially like I mean I assume at some point you know your temperature gradient evens out because of that insulation but in a big you know 10 foot thick slab do you get an initial temperature gradient that could potentially crack the slab before you have you have evened out your equ equilibrated your temperature thank <clears throat> thank you the um, um, so let's start off with a conventional form you would be doing no worse than what you be than how you'd be doing with the conventional form the temperature gradient between the surface and the core is a whole lot less and and it's stable and that's a very important key um, it doesn't fluctuate like it would otherwise now the, the thing about your, 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 the bottom of your concrete, uh, the earth is an infinite heat sink that will suck the heat out of things no matter what. And so the, the, the advantage of the self annealed process in that application is that you, you have the entire slab mass of concrete in direct thermal con, uh, you know, contact while insulated from the air. Uh, which will have a more uniform. You still have a temperature gradient because you're losing heat down into the ground, but is, is, is not going to reach anything of the magnitude of, of what you would have without having it insulated. Yeah, 
I, yeah, and I, I think that makes sense. I just wonder, it, has there, have you looked at the difference between, say, insulating a mass concrete like that versus, I mean, obviously the need to throw cooling pipes in there is a, a very expensive, but it, like, what's the difference in terms of that thermal gradient would you, that we could potentially see there? Like, is um, it, when you look at the modeling that we've done, we, we have not done a mass pour concrete in real life. But the modeling that we've done for the um, um, five foot thick, you know, uh, map foundation kind of gives us an idea of what to expect. Um, so um, it'll be better than conventional form. Uh, and I believe that the question of eliminating cooling pipes to us is a matter of how much fuel you have in that massive concrete. And you address that in our view by reducing the amount of energy that you have embedded in that in that concrete. So yeah, so typically by just adding more of the supplementary cementitious material. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? What is the R value of the insulation on this one? Um, you you thank you. That's uh, um, that you can choose. Uh, the test that we've done uh, here and where those uh, temperature profiles came from is an R19, basically four inches of uh, uh, neopore uh, graphite-filled polystyrene foam. Thank you. Thank Any you. Any questions? I think we're good. Thank you very much.